one. Hello and welcome everyone to this special unboxing episode where we'll reveal all of the brand new features of our Make Code for the Microbit 2020 beta release. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Russell and I'm the program manager for Make Code. And for the first time ever, we've got everyone from the Make Code team on this video call with us today. Um, so before we dive into the feature list, I just want to send a quick shout out to the Microbit beta testers group and everyone else who have really helped us in logging bugs and suggesting new features. You know, um, software is really only as good as the user feedback it gets. So thank you all for being super involved. Um, also big thanks to all of our translators out there who have helped us localize MakeCode uh, in 28 different languages. So that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, so the, the Make Code Microbit 2020 release is currently in beta. You can get to it at makecode.microbit.org slash beta. And the plan is to push out all of these beta updates into the live version sometime in June. Um, and remember, you can always access previous versions of Make Code using the version number in the URL. So. Um, and also um, quickly, if you have any questions as we go through all of this stuff, please go ahead and type them into the chat window. The whole team is online so we can answer any questions or talk about anything you want to talk about on this video call. So uh, without any further ado, let's get into the updates. Uh, so Richard, do you want to kick us off? Sure, sorry, unmuting myself there. Um, so the first thing that I'm going to kind of show off today is probably one of the most requested features in MakeCode, um, which is functions with return values. So real quick, let me share my desktop. All right, so um, we've had functions for since the last microbit release, um, but we've gotten a lot of questions on how you can do return values. So let me go ahead and create a new project real quick. and um, I will go ahead and make a function. So um, just like always, the functions are underneath the advanced category um, in the toolbox. And if I go here, I can make a function. I'm just gonna call it do something. And um, put that block onto my workspace. And so if I go into the functions category now, um, there's a new block, which is the return block. Um, so this does what you think, it returns a value. Um, we put a zero in there by default, but you can return anything of any type. Um, so I could put a string in there if I wanted. And you can also return nothing. Um, and then the neat thing about this return block is also that um, you can't put anything after it. So just like returns in TypeScript, we make sure that you can't break your code by accidentally putting a return at the top of the function. Um, so if you have a return value, you might ask, how do I call this function and get that return value? Well, as soon as you have this return block inside of your program, you can go into functions and, oh, it needs to have a value. There we go. Um, and now you'll see there is an oval version of your function here. Um, and this will call the function and return in the value. Um, you can also call it just in the normal way um, as a statement, but this lets you do it as an expression. So um, just to show that off real quick, if I return the number five and then forever, I'm gonna drag out a show number. And I will show the number that is returned by do something. And five is being displayed over here. So um, if you remove this return block, we will leave these blocks in your program, but you will see an error. So you can, um, uh, we won't break your program if you're refactoring code or just moving things around, um, but we will give you the warning so that you know that you've probably got a bug in your program. Um, and so um, now that we have return values, you might ask if we can do recursion. And the answer is yes. So um, I've already prepared the Fibonacci, the classic example here. And um, so this is the kind of uh, like recursive version of Fibonacci that isn't very efficient, but is good for demos. And um, I just have all of the Fibonacci sequence pr uh, printing out on the screen here. And um, I'm calling a return where I have the uh, calls to the function inside of it. 
So that's basically functions with return values. Um, this is all brand new, but we're hoping that it's pretty easy to follow. And um, if you have any feedback, totally submit it to us. Um, and so uh, that's functions with return values. Um, the second thing I'm going to demo today is another very exciting thing, which is um, a debugger. So if you've used the micro bit before for, since our last release, you've seen that there is a snail button over here that lets you turn your program into slow-mo. Um, which just makes it so that it executes very slowly and you can see all of the blocks that are um, executing and they're highlighted step by step. Um, we've gotten rid of that button and we've combined it with this new debugger functionality, which we've had in a few of our other editors, but is just coming to make code for a uh, micro bit now. Um, and so let me go ahead and go to a program I have prepared for this. All right. So this is a program um, with a lot of variables that it doesn't actually need, but I wanted to demonstrate just kind of how the variables get printed out. Um, and if the simulator shows up, we can see what it's doing. It's just drawing this spiral pattern and then erasing it. Um, so let me go ahead and click on this bug to go into debug mode, which will turn the top bar orange. And um, immediately I can see that I am stopped on a breakpoint because I already had a breakpoint set in my program. Um, I'm going to unset that for now so I can just kind of walk through these features. So my code is running and I have the um, variables table right here. If I were to stop at a breakpoint by, say, setting that breakpoint again, clicking this gray circle on the toggle block, um, my uh, I'll hit that breakpoint. It'll get highlighted, and I can see all of the values for all of the variables that are visible at this step. Um, we have step, which, if you're familiar with debuggers, this step is a step into. So if you have a function call, it will go into that function call. And we also have continue and refresh. <clears throat> and because we like the slow-mo functionality, and we think it's really useful, even if you do have a debugger. Um, we've kept it, and it's up here in this top bar now. So if I turn on that um, slow-mo, uh, my program is now executing um, at the same slow-mo rate. And I can actually see these variables changing as the program goes. So this is kind of a, a big requested feature for the slow-mo um, in our editor. But now you can actually watch your program, trace its execution, and trace the variable values too. Um, and while slow-mo is on, you can still set breakpoints and step and pause and all of those, all of that goodness. All right, so this is the debugger in blocks, um, but we also have a debugger for JavaScript. So let me go to my next project I have defined. Oh, that was the same one. All right, so this is another just drawing a little animation on the micro bit. It's lighting up all of the quadrants. The code's not really important. Um, but just like before, I'm going to go into the debugger and turn it on. And you see there is now a section called call stack, and there are more options for stepping. Um, if I go over the sidebar here, I can set a breakpoint. So I will do that right here. And now I have a call stack, which is showing me the functions um, that are being called. So I have this toggle all, which is what I'm in right now. It's being called by update LEDs, and I can click on that to go to where that call is happening. And I can even go to this inline function that doesn't have a name that's inside of forever. Um, you also notice that the variables update to wherever you're at in the code to only show the ones that you can see. Um, and we also show the parameters too. So from x, from y, 2x, 2y are all up here at the top. The tracing also works just like it does in the blocks. And like I said, we have um, all of the different permutations of step here. So we have step over, step into, and step out and the same continue and restart. So um, that's pretty much it for the debugger. Um, I should note that this also works in Python. Python will probably be talked about a little later in this stream, so I'm just going to show it off in JavaScript right now. And um, uh, there is some uh, other cool stuff that's kind of hidden under the hood, which maybe we'll uh, show um, in our live streams later. All right, so I'm going to pass it on to the next person. Cool. Let me... uh, sweet. So, hey guys, I'm Shannon, um, and I'm here to show you two new blocks features. So you may have noticed when Richard was creating his functions, we have this new icon on the function blocks, and this is a collapse icon. So if you click it, it collapses the entire function, and your code still runs. Um, it's just hidden on your workspace to allow you to organize things a little easier. 
And we've added this icon by default to all of our function blocks, but you can also collapse any top level event block by right clicking and hitting collapse all here. Um, and if you have, you know, a lot of blocks on your workspace, if you right click on the workspace, we have this collapse blocks and that will collapse everything on your workspace and you can expand just the function that you're working on. Um, and all of these collapse blocks can be dragged around just like regular blocks um, and expanded um, and modified. So the other thing I'm here to show you is um, our connection indicators. So we have this dot to dot connection. Um, I think we've had feedback that sometimes it's a little hard to tell uh, where a block is going to go when you're dragging it, especially if you have, you know, a lot of nested um, math blocks like here. So we've added this red dot indicator as well as a yellow line connecting them. So you can drag it over uh, these nested blocks and if you line up the red dots, it will snap into place. So yeah. Uh, and I think that's all that I had to show, so. All right, um, can you see my screen OK? Hi, can you guys see my screen OK? Yes, yeah, okay. We, we saw it. Uh, let me switch back. Um, Great, so I'm here actually to talk about our new Python support. So um, you guys have probably seen that we've had blocks uh, and JavaScript support for a while, but now we get Python. So first off, when you create a new project, uh, one little option is that you can now create a project that is specific to uh, JavaScript or Python, uh, or can go through all three languages, which is our default option. So let me just show you um, Python only real quick. Um, so if I create a Python only project, you'll see that it says Python up here. And this means you can't toggle between uh, different languages uh, for this project. Um, so that can be helpful just to, you know, if you know you only want to be working in one language. Uh, however, for most uh, users, we, you know, recommend the option uh, where you work in all languages um, because it's nice to be able to um, kind of compare and see and learn different languages. Uh, also, Python projects have this uh, Python logo you'll see here. Uh, and if I were to create um, a pr any project, uh, and let's say I go to JavaScript uh, and come back to the home page, and I'll save that, you'll see that um, there's like a JavaScript icon, Python icon. So that sort of helps you organize when you have lots of projects going on, uh, you know what language you're in. Anyway, so let's get into Python. Um, so I'm going to just create a default project. And so uh, like you can with JavaScript, uh, you can start off in blocks and uh, drag out whatever you would like. And then over here where you see JavaScript, there's also this drop down menu and you can now also work in Python. Uh, so you can just click on Python and you'll switch over. And now you see the exact code uh, that you had in blocks represented here in Python. Uh, and if I switch back to blocks, then your blocks are there and you can go uh, freely between all three languages. So here's Python, here's the JavaScript version, back to Python. Um, and you can, uh, one of the great things about working in the text languages is it's a little bit easier to do kind of mathy things. So uh, if I were to do, you know, sign of, uh, uh, let's see, math.py uh, times, you know, 0.5, it's a little, uh, it's nice to sort of type those out in text languages. And just to show you, you can convert back uh, into blocks. And we have this handy feature, which is that sometimes some code uh, um, can't be shown in blocks. So Python is able to express more things than blocks is, uh, generally speaking. Same thing with uh, JavaScript, and that's because um, there's just different language features available in these different languages, but you'll still get a blocks program and it'll just kind of show you a little bit of a gray area there where um, the Python code that it can't convert lives. Uh, and just to show you again, you can switch into uh, JavaScript here. So some of the things that make uh, working with Python nice in make code um, is we get a lot of great um, features like if you hover over functions, 
uh, it'll tell you something about them. So uh, it says, you know, returns the sign of a number. If I look at show string, it talks about displaying the text and it shows parameters. And you can see that there's an optional parameter here that I didn't use. Uh, also, as you're typing, you get what we call autocomplete. And autocomplete is very useful um, to discover things and help you not make typos and just speed you up as you go. Um, and uh, most of the features of, uh, of Python are here. You can create functions, you can call functions, uh, you can do all kinds of great things. Now, to help you discover what you can do, we've also reworked how the toolbox works in Python and also in uh, JavaScript. So uh, normally the toolbox shows you blocks. However, that doesn't quite make sense in text languages. So instead, what we show you is um, a API reference or or just kind of a, an indication of uh, what commands you can run. And these do correspond to blocks, but they're a bit different. So uh, you'll see that when I hover over one of them, I get this uh, grabber. And if you just drag anywhere on this, uh, you'll see that I'm now dragging out a little snippet of code uh, that's sort of filled in uh, with um, something to get me going. And I can see, OK, so I can pass an icon to show icon. And if I hit this dot here, I can see all the other icons that uh, that I could use. Um, and you'll also notice when you're working in uh, in Python, if you make an error, we'll put a red squiggly underneath uh, where your error is um, and an error name there or an error text to kind of help you figure out what's going on. Um, and yes, let me just check my list to see if there's anything else I want to go over. Um, yes, so I think that's uh, a, a brief whirlwind. Of, Daryl, uh, mm -hmm. there is uh, one um, clarification uh, question yeah. that came up. So someone asked me, not in this chat, but before, um, is this compatible with MicroPython? Uh, it is in general not. So some some things, um, some MicroPython code might work, but the big difference is that the APIs um, that we use in uh, MakeCode Python are the same ones we use in blocks. And because we made them match up exactly with how they work with blocks and how they work in TypeScript, they don't quite align with how they work in MicroPython. Um, so uh, yes, in general, uh, the MakeCode uh, Python APIs are just a little bit different, and you can't copy paste code between the two of them. However, if you were to write something that's just algorithmic, like Fibonacci is a great example, uh, that you could probably just copy paste between them because the math, uh, the math libraries and the things that are core to the Python language, those things should translate between MicroPython and MakeCode Python. Uh, great, thanks for um, thanks for tuning in, and I'll hand it off to uh, actually myself, unless Galen is on the call. I'm here. Oh, great! I'll hand it off to you, Galen. All right. Well, with the uh, added support of Python, it makes sense to go ahead and add that support to the tutorials as well. Let me try to share here. Is my screen on? I don't see it quite yet. Uh oh. Your kitchen is on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I need to. There we go. Did I did it? Yep, I see it. Okay. So um, let's just pick a, this. You know, the first tutorial. You'll notice here that we now have not just blocks, but there's Python and JavaScript as available language options to choose for your tutorial. Um, so let's pick Python since we are highlighting that here. Go to the first step and you'll see now instead of a, a blocks hint, there'll be some Python code there for the first step in the default. Also, as Daryl was saying, the toolbox now has code API pullouts for snippets. We can pull the forever block and that uh, gets us kind of, well, we could actually make that match we have in our hint if we want to, or we could use the code as provided. And I'll move to the next step. And inside here, I want to 
put in a show LEDs. And I'll drop that in front of the pass and get rid of the pass. And if I want to, I can go ahead and type in the icon image that is being shown in the hint. I won't do all of it. I'll just show a little bit here. And we'll move on to uh, the next step. And you can pull out another one. And there we are. So this, as in similar to the uh, blocks, we now have a whole different context, which is in text. And we can code in Python. And uh, also, you, you might have noticed when I first hit the Python selection next to it was a JavaScript. If you want to do a JavaScript text-based coding tutorial, you can do that also. And I think that's it. Unshare here. Great, thanks, Jalen. Uh, Pelly, are you up? Yeah, I'm up. Um, and Richard, you'll want to pin my screen. Uh, but while this is happening, am I the person creating an echo? Uh, someone's not muted. Galen, can you make sure you're muted? All right. Uh, so, Richard, are you going to pin my my video yep. and then um, you're good to go. I'm going to I'm going to demo a few things. Um, I'm going to demo our brand new uh, GitHub integration. Now I'll I'll pivot to the in context uh, translations. Can I start? Because I'm seeing. Oh, hold on. Oh yeah, I'm live. Sorry, I was yep, looking at the wrong. I have too many windows. Okay, so uh, let's get to it. Uh, we are here in uh, in Make Code, and I've got. Uh, I'm going to create a new project here. Uh, the name doesn't matter right now, and it's going to be the amazing uh, flashing heart demo, or beating heart. Kind of our favorite uh, place to start. So I'm going. I'm doing my coding here, and typically when we want to save things, we're going to go and do you know, a save at the bottom, or we can click download. Uh, but we've added support for um, this icon here. And I'm going to kind of highlight it here if I can. So if you look at here, right there, I'm going to make sure you see it. There we go. And that is the GitHub uh, integration. So when you click on that, it's going to First time is going to tell you to sign in with GitHub. It's free to get an account. And well, you'll have to go through that. So it's probably a good idea to do it first before you get that. But when you click on sign in, you'll then have to authorize our app. And then most of the time it comes back. And I'm now signing in with GitHub and it's asking me to create a repository. A repository in the GitHub world is a place where you're going to save your files. Uh, and most big companies, a lot of big companies use uh, use GitHub to save their code. So it's pretty good, pretty safe place to put your code. I'm gonna call that the beating heart. I'm gonna give a good name and the description. You know, cool microbit code. All right, and I can do uh, go ahead and create that. Um, this will create a new repository under your account in GitHub, and that means that you'll be able to save your code but also share your code across different machines uh, or even uh, collaborate with your friends as far as coding together on the same project. Now, what you're going to notice is that the icon is now uh, showing you a check mark. Um, and it's telling you the check mark means that all your changes are in the cloud. Now, if I go ahead and make a change, because I, I really want to you know, kind of make my animation more exciting, I'm going to put a uh, uh, maybe a T-shirt in it. Uh, so now there's an arrow here in the icon. It's a bit cut out in the video. Um, but you click on that, what you'll see is the Git, what we call the GitHub view. So it, it provides you a graphical view of the changes in your block. In this case, uh, what changes, this one is colored. Uh, so you either add it or modified it. We, we don't really differentiate. And the gray blocks are kind of around there, they haven't changed. So you can look at your code and figure out 
whether you like that. Um, and if you're happy, you can say, you know, added some cool icon. Add a message, uh, click on commit and push changes. This will save your code in the cloud. So once you've done that and it came back, your code is safe. You'll probably never lose it again. Um, and then you can keep editing. So I can go back and I can have this very nice programming flow and I make a change. I go to GitHub, look at my change, make sure it, it looks good. And in this case, I'm like, mm, I'm not really happy about that one. Uh, I'm going to go and and delete that. I can actually revert local changes before I make them. So maybe I completely messed up my code and I really want to undo this. So I'm going to revert it. Um, and bam, we're, we're back to safety and happiness. And I'm back to my three animations here. Uh, there's also a more advanced uh, undo feature, which I'm going to show here. I'm going to go and commit it to this change. And this is all happening in the flow of make code. Uh, so you'd never really have you need to go and and go in GitHub. So let's say I really want to go back to a version like a day or two days before. Uh, we have a whole list. We have the entire list of commits you've done to GitHub here. So you can come back to uh, maybe two or three or 10 or 100 versions before. Um, if you click on that, you'll see the difference between the version that's in the cloud and the version that's in your browser. And if you want to, you can basically jump to that version. So this lets you not only audit all the work you've done, but also come back to a previous version of, let's say the work you've done for the last two days is really not good. You want to come back to something else. Uh, and that's in, its, uh, that's in a nutshell, the experience of uh, doing, um, just wanting to, to finish this section. If you want to know what it looks like in GitHub itself, there is this, there's this button here, and this will take you to GitHub, the website in your project. So these are all the files that we've saved. And you know, this is this is GitHub, so it's a bit complicated UI, but these are all the files that we've done. And it also has a rendering of the blocks so that you can preview what, what you've done. And it has instructions on how you can re-import that in make code. So if your students is confused on how to use GitHub, it's all here. All right, but uh, in a segue to the next demo, I'm going to show what it feels that when you're doing JavaScript. So when you're doing JavaScript and GitHub, hey, think hey Pelly, we yeah. we have a question in the chat um, from Michael. He's asking if you have a project we which uses which also uses an extension, in its own repo. Um, does it commit the changes separately to the extension repo and the project repo? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, now you can actually develop multiple extensions together in make code and upload them and we'll handle that for you. Uh, so you can have one project that uses another project that and both of them are in GitHub in separate repos and we can handle that. So we can handle all kind of the and show in fact I'm going to show you what what this means for this project. So I'm building an extension here. This means I'm actually going to build a new block which is going to be cool, you know, cool stuff my favorite block name, and uh, I'm going to add this annotation so that it becomes a block. And in this case, I'm just going to show a string on the screen. So that's a custom block, if you're familiar with that, that we've had that. I'm going to clean up my project. I'm going to remove the blocks. And uh, now, how do I test this? Um, it's a bit complicated to test this because uh, I need to kind of reference it and it's not yet in GitHub. So we have a new feature to test extensions. Um, so if you go into GitHub view, you'll see that, uh, first of all, we have uh, text if, just like you would see in all the, the regular code editors. So red means deleted and green means added or modified. Uh, but we also have a way to test extensions, uh, which is, uh, whoops, the arrow goes the other way like this, uh, which is an easy way to, without having to go through the cloud, test locally that your custom blocks you're building for your extensions are working. So you've got my, I've got my cool stuff block here, uh, but I really don't like the name because I, I forgot an F. So I'm going to go back to the other tab, I'm gonna go back here and I'm going to fix my typo here. You know, stuff, stuff matters. Uh, and I'm just going to change tab. The tab is going to reload, and my block is now updated. 
It's a very seamless way to test your extension. Um, once you're happy with your extension, uh, go back to GitHub, commit your code as usual. I'm going fast here. Commit your code. There's going to be a lot of make a change, review change, commit your code, make a change, commit your change, uh, review your can, commit your code. Something that the kids are going to be drilled to do uh, and they'll have their, their code safe. Um, now I'm an extension writer, so I'm going to actually create a release so that my users have a um, a stable version. And again, this is this is uh, done for you. We can we we'll let you define the versioning of the release. So there's a this fun system called Sember. And in this case, it's just a patch. I'm just going to create a release. So we have a new flow for extension writers that is integrated into the editor that allows you to create uh, these cool extensions that come with the accessories. Now, the last demo I'm going to show you is because I built this really cool, cool stuff demo. I'm going to build a tutorial for it on the fly. And for that, I'm going to, I'm going to add a tutorial TS file, uh, markdown file, so MD. And, uh, you know, I'm going here and I'm going to say tutorial step one, do something, and then step, and then I'm going to add a little snippet. And that's going to be demo cool stuff. And maybe there's a step two and three and four, but we'll stop at. So this is our syntax to create tutorial. Lorem ipsum. Here we go. Uh, super cool. And again, I don't want to go through the cloud to publish this. So I'm going to use this tiny little icon here. Very well hidden. Uh, that little lab icon. And when I click on that, it is going to open my tutorial locally. And I'm going to be able to test that in my browser. You can see that I've got my tip here. I've got a preview. Uh, I can test that everything works well. I'm wording like, you know, if I like this, uh, I can go back here and publish my, my tutorial. So again, publishing means committing and pushing the changes to GitHub. Um, and then if you want to share this tutorial with your users, there's also a new icon here. Right there is the second one, the little share icon. Uh, hold on. Whoop. And if I click that, it gives me a URL. This URL, uh, your users will, you can share that with your users and then they can run uh, your tutorial. It takes a few minutes because we have caching. So this URL will take uh, uh, an hour or up to a day to be live once you're ready. But that's how you can create a tutorial, both in blocks and as, uh, and we also have the spy tutorial, so you can can also have now a tutorial that works also in, oops, no, that didn't work out. All right, something wrong happened in my demo. Um, so that's the tutorial. Um, all right, so I have a few things. Now, uh, Jacqueline, you want me to take a break and then I come back with more demos because I'm going to be, I might be, uh, or you want me to show, oh, I think I have the in-context translations. All right. Uh, one, one more thing that is completely uh, unrelated is translation. So a lot of our users don't speak English, or and especially the kids, and it's very important that uh, the editor is translated. Uh, myself, I'm native uh, Belgian speaker, French, uh, so uh, I didn't learn English until uh, you know I was like 14 or something. So if I was a microbit user today, I wouldn't understand anything that's here. Uh, and previously, it was a bit painful to translate all this. Uh, but we've added a new feature, and I'm going to show how to enable that. So you go want to go to the language dialog, which is here on the top right. And this is the typical dialog we've had to select your language. Now, if you look at uh, the bottom right here, you'll see that there is a new button right there. Um, and this will turn on what we call in-context translations. And with in-context translation, what's going to happen is you'll be able to translate MakeCode from within MakeCode. And I'm going to sign in with my GitHub. And now what you can see is, and it's if you look close, you'll see there's a little square around all these. So every string that can be translated in MakeCode uh, is going to have a little bit of a little annotations. And for example, I can go here and I can click on that and I'm taken to the crowd in 
um, interface. And I can edit, I can suggest a new translation, I can do all my crowd and flow, which is what our translator use, but I can do that uh, straight from the editor. And you'll see that um, it does some funky rendering uh, sometimes, but uh, you're also able to, for example, translate blocks. So if you right click on a block, you'll see that there is a new menu item here called translate this block, which is in French translate, traduire ce bloc. Uh, and then that allows you to translate. Uh, whoops, you want to you want to click the button that allows you to translate the block itself, the syntax of the block. So this is in context translations. And if you're uh, there's uh, if you if you want to help us translate uh, make code, uh, this is how you get to that. Uh, there's no really easy way to get out of it. You just have to close the browser. It will create these funny projects. Uh, so be aware of that. Um, but that's uh, that's all there is. So if you're if you've been translating make code, hopefully this is going to make it so much easier for you uh, to do your work. And uh, by saying that, I think I am done with this demo, and I'm giving away the token to the next person. All right, Mihal, are you are you up? Sure, uh, I just needed a while to unmute myself. Um, so I'm gonna uh, show. Okay, uh, so I'm going to show you. Um, uh, so I'm Michal Moskal, by the way. Um, and I'm gonna show you a um, multi editor feature. So if you go to make code multi, it shows you uh, two editors side by side, two microbit editors side by side, and this is useful if you, for example, if you if you are building a, a project that uses radio, and then you want to have a different code for transmitter and receiver, for example. So in this case, for example, we want to uh, let's say that we want to write a um, microbit code that uses two microbits to steer a, a car, like a remote control car, and then. So to do that, we write two programs, one for the car and one for the remote control, right? And the programs are actually quite simple. Uh, in both cases, you actually have to set the group, uh, which is like the radio channel sort of that you will use. And the group has to match on both sides. Otherwise, they won't be able to send messages between each other. And the car is listening to, um, to a number that it gets and steers a servo, uh, as you can see here. And uh, uh, on the other side, the remote control, uh, if you press A on B, it sends the number that to turn the server left and right. So this is like really simplified, right? And um, yeah, so you can go full screen on both sides. And um, you know, if you press A here, you send this number. If you press B here, you get this other number. So you no longer have to have uh, a single program that acts as both transmitter and receiver to test those things in the, in the simulator. You can instead do it with um, with two two editors at the same time. Um, this feature also works um, if you go here in the, in the normal editor. You can um, you can go here to the to the project view, and then if you um, you can say for example select the remote, and you can open it in new tab. So now you have one program in this tab. And then we open the other one in the other tab. Um, <clears throat> and now we can send messages between them. So if I, hopefully, if I press uh, A, it will it it would send it would send to the to the other window. So you can you can switch between windows. But usually this is an easier way of doing that side by side like this. Um, the top thing is more useful if you if you have more than one screen, for example. Uh, yeah, I think that's it on this side. Great, thanks. I think I'm back here for demo. Um, all right, so uh, here we go. And uh, Richard, you, there we go. Uh, so I'm going to show uh, a feature called Web USB today, and uh, it's very exciting. Uh, Web USB is something that we kind of uh, we shipped uh, in the editor last year, but it was still not very well supported in most browsers. So today, if you're running Chrome or running the latest Edge, you're going to be able to leverage this feature. 
And this feature allows you to download directly into the microbit without touching or doing file transfer and things like that. So here I am in the MakeCode editor and I have a microbit here connected to my PC with the USB cable. Hey, uh, Kelly? Yeah. Can you um, move your screen up just a smidge? We only see half of the download button. All right. Tell me when you see it. It's because there's a delay in Mixer. You see it now? Um, I think your video is actually frozen for me. You might want to turn off video and turn it back on. Uh, in Teams? Yep. I might come back for the demo. <laughs> uh, yeah, am I back? Yeah, it looks yep, like I'm live. All right, cool. Uh, and everybody can see the button in Teams. We good there? Yes. Yeah, all right. Uh, perfect. So in the past, when you click download, the regular flow was click download, grab the file, then find a way to send that file into, you know, the drive, the microbit drive, right? You know, find your microbit drive and then send it to your microbit somewhere. And this is very painful for students. Uh, it can be very difficult for them to um, to do the drag and drop. So now there is a new feature, and the way it works is that you're going to pair your device. So you can see that there's a new menu on the download, and there's a pair device um, button there. And you only have to pair once per machine, typically, unless your browser gets cleaned up. Uh, and there's instructions on how to pair, which is basically connect your machine with the cable to the computer. And then if you have the right uh, firmware on your microbit, what you're going to see is, uh, whoops, that wasn't expected. Um, let's see. So the first, uh, when you're going to click pair device, you're going to see this BBC microbit CMS blah, 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 blah. There's something called BBC microbit. Uh, if you don't see it, we have a guide on how you're going to see it. So that's pretty much beyond this video. But if you don't see a microbit there, there is a little bit of something you have to do to upgrade it. We'll have a clear guide on that and click connect. And now look at the download button. It has a super amazing uh, animation that I designed myself uh, that, that shows up. So if you see the USB icon on the download, it means you're connected. You're connected to microbit. And now check this out. I'm going to click download. I'm going to change the animation to T-shirt. So if you look at the if you look at the microbit right now, it's doing heart. I'm going to do T-shirt. I'm going to do uh, happy and happy. Right. So I'm going to change clearly something different. I'm going to click on download. And I'm not doing anything. I have my hands up. Uh, and now it's been flashed, right? All the way, very fast, almost immediate. Can change again to my favorite T-shirt animation, T-shirt toilet. Uh, I don't know if it's toilet. It's probably a kid basket. And it's doing it. So this is a very uh, intuitive, fast way to get your code in the micro bit. It gets even better when you're looking at sensors. So if you use our plot LED block, our favorite plot LED, and let's say you want to look at uh, acceleration, uh, then um, you know you can do that in simulator. It's great. But now I want to do, and in simulator you can also look at how it looks like on a chart. Uh, but what's happening when you go for the real world, uh, now you can do that pretty easily. You're going to go and click on download. It's going to download the code. And then after a few seconds, when we reconnect, you'll see this uh, show console. And that means we're getting data from the device live. And we can visualize that. So now it's not the simulator anymore. If I move simulator, nothing happens. But if I move my micro bit, you know, uh, I'm actually seeing live what the sensor is doing. I'm actually seeing live what I'm I'm writing to the serial, and that is part of the um, web USB feature. And we've done a lot of work around reliability, so you can unplug it, of course, then replug it, and if you wait a few seconds, and then if the demo goes are with me, it'll come back live and uh, it'll start streaming. So let's say you're streaming, getting data, it gets unplugged because I don't know it fell off. But bring it back. And then after a few seconds, we have the micro bit coming back live and so forth. So a lot of work around reliability and also the feature uh, is now readily avail available in most browsers. Uh, so we really encourage you to uh, get that going to your classrooms. I'm done. <laughs>
Cool. So it sounds like it's me next. Let's see. Share desktop. And oh, got to find the right thing. There we go. So it should be up. OK, so I'm going to show off some new blocks. I'm Joey, by the way. Uh, so the first ones I'm going to show off are some music blocks. Uh, if we go under the music category, we have two new blocks in here. Uh, the first one is one that I like quite a bit, and I'm going to use real quick so I don't hurt my ears because we can't transmit sound very well on Teams for this sort of thing. Uh, it's set volume, so that'll change how loud your device is. Uh, if we have a, look, our little slider right here, we can see the maximum is 255, which is the max volume we can use, and it will go all the way down to zero. So I'll use that real quick just so things play nice right here. Uh, the other one we have was made by our intern, Kim, last year, and it's a really cool new way to make sounds. So I'll drag this in here, uh, and it is a lot like the other sound blocks. They will sound similar, except when we click on it, it has a cool new field editor that we can use to design our sounds. Uh, probably can't hear it because it's playing on my device and we don't, kind of a weird thing to set up playing sounds on here, but it'll play the little sound as you preview it, do it. It'll change the thing and you can just design your own little simple sounds. Uh, there's also a gallery in here so we can use to use some pre-built ones. So we have a scale, preview it or just use it and add it into our little sound. Uh, editor. Okay, so that's the first one. And then the other thing I had to show was some uh, blocks for loops. So there are several different types of loops in Arcade at the moment. We have our for loops, we have our while loops, and then for of loops and all that sort of things. Uh, and those are very useful, but sometimes if you get a complicated one or you're doing something that needs some special care, you need to be able to exit the loop or skip some things in the loop. Uh, so that's what these two new blocks, if we look down here, they are the break and continue blocks. Uh, these ones, if you know JavaScript, you will probably know them from that. But continue means to skip this element in the loop. And break means to exit the loop entirely. So if we look at this one, I have a little array. And we have 1, 2, 5, 100, 42, and 4. Uh, and I have a little condition in here to check. If the value is over 50, uh, if we do continue right here and we restart it, uh, we'll see that it prints out 54 because it's ignoring this 100 and it's just printing out 1 plus 2 plus 5 plus 42 plus 4, which is 54. Uh, if I swap that out for a break statement, uh, it will go until it finds a value that is over 100. So it'll go 1 plus 2 plus 5. And then it'll see this and then quit and exit the loop. So then we just show eight. Um, I think that was about it for my demo. So back to whoever wants to take it. Uh, is that me? Yep, yes. it's you, Abhijit. All right. Hi, this is Abhijit. I'm going to scare my, share my screen. You guys see my screen? Yes. Yes. All right, awesome. So what I'm demoing today is a share feature, which you all know. Um, it's, it's on the top. Let me just lower it down. It's in the top left corner, this feature. When you click on it, it basically saves your project in the cloud, and you can access using a URL from any of your devices. We had this for a while. People love it. But we have added something new to this feature. Let me just publish the project now. This is a hot potato. It's basically a simple project where uh, it has a timer which runs randomly, and it, after some time, it displays a different message. Now, if you see the share page, you get the link. You can copy it. You can paste it in your browser. But you can also share it to Facebook, Twitter, or Discord right from here. Right. The biggest, coolest thing about it is there's a QR code here, and you can point your phone right now to this QR code and it'll, this project will come to your device, any mobile device which has a camera. Uh, it's a handy way to share your feature across devices. Uh, that's pretty much it from my end. Keep sharing. Who's next?
All right, and we're wrapping up. I think, uh, Tom, you've got the last segment. <laughs> All right, cool. Last but not least, yes, can you see me? I am sh trying to share, what am I sharing? Oh yeah, hi everybody, uh, Tom Ball here. Um, this has been a really uh, great overview of what we've been doing uh, uh, over the last year to add new things uh, for the micro bit into make code. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, Microsoft uh, has been uh, with the micro bit project from the very beginning. It's been five years now, uh, 2015 in the spring of 2015, we, we all got together uh, the original team and uh, Peli, Michal, myself and Steve Hodges were on that. And uh, we're really excited about how things have grown over the years, uh, the uh, uh, move from touch develop to make code and the growth of make code and support of all these new exciting features and the GitHub, the debugging, uh, everything you saw today. In fact, you might have seen one new feature that just passed you by and that I'm going to show, which is uh, the new project feature. So when you click on new project, we used to just go into the browser immediately with the uninformative name uh, untitled for your project name, but now uh, you can give your project a name. You could hit return and, and get the old behavior, or you can uh, you can give your uh, project a, a meaningful name uh, and then and then hit the create button. Um, so that's it from me. I want to say thank you uh, to Jacqueline, to the whole team, and to all the users, and especially to the Microbit Education Foundation. Thank you very much. All right, thanks everyone for tuning in. And um, I've posted a link to the blog post in the chat window. So uh, if you wanna take a look at the documentation and where you can find more information about all the features that we showed today, go ahead and head over to the blog post. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. See ya.